All right. Uh, so you want to start up that uh, recording mechanism? Yeah, it's already recording. Oh. We need a theme song. Yeah. Maybe. How about we use the uh, the old song which we are using in the videos? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Or we can just sing together. Yeah. Too bad it's got no lyrics. Uh oh, the theme song? Yeah. All right. Well, we should probably get started. Hey, we should actually include this part in the recording just for fun. Okay. <laughs> I'm in. All right, great. Well, hey everyone, welcome to the eighth Pocket Now Pocket Cast. Uh, we skipped last week because there was a lot going on with CTIA. Evan was out at CTIA, so let me introduce everyone. I'm Brandon Miniman, editor in chief of Pocket Now. Uh, Evan Blass, our managing editor, is here with us. Say hi, Evan. Hey guys. Hey Brandon. Hey, hey. and Anton Di Nagy is here, also known as Tony, a senior editor. Say hi, Tony. Hey Brandon. Hey Evan. Hey everybody. Awesome. So we've got so much to talk about today and a lot of exciting things, a lot of uh, forward momentum in the smartphone industry, which always makes us sleep better at night somehow. Um, Evan has just gotten back just a, a few days ago from CTIA, uh, where lots of new phones were announced. Evan, what would you say, how would you summarize the event if you had to do so in a, in a few sentences? Exhausting. From my point of view. From, <laughs> for, for those of you that don't know, covering a trade show uh, is exhausting. It's constant walking and writing and calling and... Yeah, I mean, for someone who, you know, whose job it is to, to sit behind a monitor for, for most of the day, I'm not used to, to nearly this much walking. You know, it must have been a couple miles each day. We need to... Uh... We need, to, we need to all exercise so that, uh, you know, these trade shows become <laughs> a little easier. Yeah, uh, but um, on a more serious note, um, I thought there, there was definitely some good stuff there and, and a few surprises. But, but in general and, and in talking to some of my colleagues, I think, I think most people found this to be a rather um, uneventful um, event, if you will. Um, and... And just like Mobile World Congress, just like CES, uh, it seems that Android ran the show here. Yeah, but but unlike those events, which which did have quite a bit of uh, announcements, there there weren't really that many new phones. I mean, we had the uh, you know the Evo 3D, the the G2X, um, and well, some of these are rebrands. So you know, how many new new phones were there uh, besides the the Evo 3D? I can't think of any. Yeah, I'm getting back to my old rant. Uh, did HTC allow any of you uh, members of the media to have some hands-ons with the Facebook devices because they wouldn't allow us to touch them at MVC? I didn't ask. Uh, I'm, I don't. I didn't see any of those devices there. Oh, so they weren't even there. Hmm. Yeah, that. <laughs> those, those should be landing. I guess when is when is this was that? Later in the spring or maybe even summer. The cha-cha and the salsa and the tango and the merengue. Or the cha-cha-cha, as we've heard that cha-cha is not a word to use in Spain. Yeah, that's, that's all very confusing. So yeah, this, uh, this Evo 3D was somewhat of a surprise, uh, though not uh, a couple of days before the event. Pretty impressive hardware here. Uh, impressive enough to where Evan is satisfied, having written to HTC many times, expressing his dissatisfaction. Dissatis what's that word? Dis Dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction, yes. Oh, With, uh, snap, getting schooled by the Romanian on your grammar. Oh, uh, I know. <laughs> uh, but, they, but they really came to the table with some good stuff. I mean, uh, two cores clocking at 1.2 gigahertz. Uh, hopefully battery's not too bad. 3D display with a dedicated camera button so you can switch from 2D to 3D. Uh, they brought a new version of Sense to the table with a spinny carousel thingy that kind of comes off the flyer. Um, Evan actually got some hands-on time with Evo 3D. What did you think about it? I thought it was a great device. I mean, you know, I, you always have to preface these things by saying that it you know, probably wasn't running final firmware, and in this case, probably nowhere near close to final firmware because it's, it's several months out yet from, from getting released. But the, the functionality, I thought, was uh, impressive. Uh, you know, there, there really is a 3D effect to the screen when, when the proper content is loaded up, you know, so that's not just necessarily marketing, but uh, the question is, and this is the question we've been asking over and over, is this something people really want? Um, at, at least in the demos I saw, I mean, it, it was a neat demo, but 
I don't think they, they've come up with a lot of content um, where I, I should say a lot of pre-recorded content that um, where, where it really adds to the experience. Um, now, one, one area I think that could probably change is games. Um, I think they'll, they'll be able to do some clever things with 3D that maybe we haven't seen on, um, you know, 2D sets before. But as far as, you know, the blockbuster bringing out, you know, movies in 3D, it's, you know, it, it's really just going to be, um, you know, sort of gimmicky uh, uh, until they're, they're, they're adding some more, um, some more value to the content, I should say. Yeah, it sounds like games is really going to be the uh, the main focus of, of of showing off 3D technology once once people start doing that. Uh, both of you have actually experienced a glasses free 3 3D display on a phone. Tony, I think you said that it hurt your eyes when you looked at the Optimus 3D. Yes, it might have something to do with the either screen resolution or refresh rate or simply my eyes are bad. And uh, I was asking Evan this uh, this question, uh, I think it was a couple of days ago, and uh, he told me that he couldn't really see the, the screen directly, but he didn't notice any flickering. And I did notice slight flickering when not looking directly at the LG Optimus 3D screen. And this brings up a question to, to you, Evan. Did you see any dedicated 3D software coming from HTC pre-installed on the Evo 3D? Because if I remember well, on the Optimus 3D at MVC in Barcelona, we saw some dedicated YouTube application in 3D. Uh, you know, what? <coughs> excuse me, that's a good question. I didn't, I didn't really look. Um, I will say that, um, that anecdotally from, from other people who have uh, seen both devices and who, who have used both devices, and I guess I could have uh, taken a look at the Optimus 3D at CTAA. I probably should have done that. Um, that the um, the Evo 3D screen gives a better 3D effect than the um, the Optimus 3D. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And it, of course, the uh, the Evo 3D has a 960 by 540 display, whereas the Optimus 3D has an 800 by 480 display. Not sure if that makes much of a difference. Uh, at CES, I saw a 50-inch glasses-free TV. And the two problems with it were, one, it was very low resolution, which really doesn't matter for a phone. And two, the viewing angle was inc incredibly limited. Did you guys find that if you move the phone kind of wrong, the 3D effect turned to blurry junk? Yeah, but I think that's, that's almost going to be inherent in, in the technology. Um, you know, you're, the, the 3D, it's, it, the way they're designing it is just, for you know the the effect to be for the viewer looking head on, and and I'm not sure that and you know until we get some of these um, these TVs like they have in um, in, in some smaller um, LCDs where uh, it's a you know you can get a totally different picture from each angle. You can have someone sitting on the left and someone sitting on the right, and they can be seeing something different. Mm -hmm. Until they bring that to 3D, um, this is going to be a problem that uh, I you know I don't even want to call it a problem. It's just going to be a uh, a part of the experience. Yeah, yeah def a drawback. I was definitely, say it's the same. Yeah, go on. Sorry. Oh no, no, go ahead. I, I would. I was going to say that it's definitely the same thing with the uh, Optimus 3D too. So it has a tolerance of approximately 20 to maximum 25 degrees in angle in uh, in on the side. So you have to stay straight in the front of the uh, screen to see the 3D effect on the Optimus 3D, but I played with the, the Sharp Lynx 3D also at MVC, and that device seemed to have a larger viewing angle in terms of the 3D, of course. But, but larger probably means that if you've got five friends and you're showing them a 3D video, probably two of them on the on Two the or sides. three of them, yeah. Two or three of them will see. You will see front, uh, in front of the device and the one on the left and the one on the right, but uh, the fourth and the fifth will not see anything. Well, have you guys used the, the 3D uh, sets where you do need glasses? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You have? Yep. Mm -hmm. And are, are they limited as well? Or is it, is it only these glasses-free that are uh, where this is uh, an issue? I, I think it's the glasses-free. And I think this is why uh, we're sort of, in, in terms of the big screen televisions for your home, that's why we're stuck in this glasses thing. Because... The technology isn't there yet to do glasses free at a wide viewing angle. It'll be here eventually, but right now it's just it's too expensive to do. It, it's funny that we're saying that because um, just a year ago we were saying glasses free 3D was too expensive to do. Um, so so uh, it's probably 
it's going to get better with each generation. I don't know if the technology actually allows for a larger viewing angle in 3D. Uh, take only the uh, classic LCD, TFT, IPS, or AMOLED screens. They all lose quality when you are viewing them from the sides. Now, some start losing at 45 degrees, some third or th some below. But because of the glasses free technology, which combines the left and right uh, 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 images, like on, on an interlaced video, but uh, not really interlaced, they, because of this technology, I'm not sure they will be able to uh, magnify that angle. Yeah, most probably they will improve it, but uh, don't expect, this is my personal opinion, don't expect to see a wide viewing angle on a glasses 3D display. Yeah, we're going to have to get in our time machine once again. Uh, we're working on building one right now, but we can't talk much about it. So. <laughs> I have to say that, excuse me, in general, that the seems the reception to 3D hasn't been great all that so far. You know, I, I sort of compared to um, to when HD came on the scene, and you know, I, even though HD it was sort of slow in getting adopted, I think everyone saw the value there. Um, you know, and, and what was holding most people back from getting a set was just they were they were really expensive. Yeah. Um, but now, uh, you know, there there seems to be almost a, a bit of a backlash against 3D, as as if some people think that that the manufacturers are sort of pushing the technology on us, and and we don't really want it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very clear that the the manufacturers need to bridge the gap to to start generating profits again because everyone bought an HD TV, and if they didn't, they're going to buy one soon. Uh, and so, so TV sales are going to plummet, and the only way to get them back up again is to have something new and exciting. And yeah, I, I think there is backlash. I don't think people want to sit in their living room with, um, you know, uh, funky glasses on, and I don't think they want to pay a big premium for something that there's not much content for still. I mean, there's there's like two or three 3D channels out there. It's like HD all over again. Right. Cool. Well, let's move on. Uh, Sprint also announced the, we kind of knew about this, the Nexus S 4G uh, coming this spring at $199. That's going to be a cool phone. I mean, the Nexus S is a very lean Android phone with no UI junk. And to add WiMAX to that is a pretty good proposition. Um, nothing terribly interesting beyond that. Do either of you uh, want to comment on that or should we move on to the next thing? No, it's just the Nexus S. You're right, just the Nexus S. Yeah, I agree with you. It, for anyone who's on, on Sprint, it, it's going to be a, a really compelling device. Indeed. Uh, okay, so another phone announced was the LG Thrill. That's a... AT&T is really good with the inspiring names, pun intended. Uh, they've got the Inspire and the Thrill and what other uplifting names? Infuse. Infuse. Yeah. H7S. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that, that one's a little depressing. Uh, yeah, so I mean, the thr not much to talk about here either. The LG Thrill is coming to AT&T. Uh, it's going to be the Optimus 3D in the U.S., uh, you know, Tegra 3, or not 3, that'd be great. But Tegra 2, uh, glasses-free 3D. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, well, it's just interesting that um, that at and sort of sort of one-upping T-Mobile a little bit with the, you know, the, the Thrill is basically, you know, a, a 3G-enabled uh, um, Optimus 2X, which T-Mobile is getting as the G2X. And... You know, within within a couple months, uh, you know, uh, a little bit over a year, it, it's really not going to matter. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny because LG has the Optimus 3D. If you take out the 3D part, you get the Optimus 2X. Now HTC has the Evo 3D, and if you take out the 3D, you get the Pyramid, perhaps. Oh, I see <laughs> what you did there. <laughs> I've been I've been thinking about that all week. Just had to. Uh, yeah. We don't know that to be true, though, do we, Brandon? I mean, for all we know, the pyramid could have 3D. Right. As as Tony's mentioned on on several occasions, you know, the pyramid is one of the uh, is one of the most iconic um, three dimensional shapes. Oh, that is a very very interesting observation. But then, on the other hand, I mean, how often does HTC really, you know? associate or, or, you know, make a, a connection between the code names and, and what the phone does functionally. You know, what, 
Uh, a few of them, yes, like Mondrian. That was that was definitely uh, hearkening to uh, to Windows Phone Seven and, and where the uh, the the homepage UI came from. You know that guy Pierre Mondrian who with, with the paintings. So so some of them they do, but but I would say that the vast majority they don't. This plus then there's the um, the other part of the story, which is the marketing and sales part. We know that the main markets for smartphones are the USA and Europe. And if you take out the 3D from uh, from the Evo 3D and you get it to Europe without the 3D, then Europe will remain without any 3D HTC devices. And I think HTC does not want to do that. True, well, but uh, on, the, on the other hand, uh, the Evo 3D is is and is going to be a very thick and heavy device. It's a, a, as thick as an Evo 4G and they need to they need to bring these specs for QHD screen 1.2 gigahertz uh, dual processor in a smaller petite sexy razor thin form factor and they can't do that with the 3D added. Well, remember what we just saw yesterday Brandon is that it's very very likely that that the Evo 3D is going to be released internationally. Um, there was a, a whole specs page up with, uh, with with mentions of GSM bands all over the place, and uh, HTC pulled that down today, so it's no longer there. Uh, and and the phone is even unbranded; it it, it doesn't have Sprint branding on it. The, mm. the pictures that they use. So I mean, I don't I don't think it could be any more clear that there's a, a GSM version of the of that phone on the way. The the question is whether the pyramid is going to be that, or if the pyramid will nix the 3D display. No, that's what I'm saying is that, I mean, we, we actually have seen pictures of, of the GSM Evo 3D, if you want, because the, if the only Evo 3D out there is on Sprint, then the only pictures of it should have Sprint branding on it, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Have you ever seen, like, you know, a Droid Incredible without Ryzen branding? No. No, oh, so, so the only reason that they would have all that stock photography of... Uh, of the Evo 3D without uh, without a mention of Sprint on it is because it's uh, it's also a, an, an international GSM phone. And speaking of Verizon, when do you guys think Verizon will have its first 3D device, and what would it be? Because obviously AT and T has its own, Sprint has its own, so Verizon has to keep it up. It'll be from Motorola, I bet. Mm. It's a good thought. Samsung needs a 3D phone too. Yeah, Sam I think they'll have one soon. I do too. I think um, Samsung's in the same boat as LG, and we've discussed this before. In that, you know, these are our manufacturers who have who are in several verticals with, you know, being both uh, home theater and um, mobile. So, so you know, their one of their uh, their thoughts is that you know to push people into these multi thousand dollar 3D TVs. They first need to have content that they're going to want to see on them, and what better way than than to put these uh, stereoscopic stereoscopic cameras in their pockets as part of their phones? It's a really good point. I think uh, a lot of people would be more inclined to buy a 3D TV if they knew they could play their 3D videos taken on their smartphone on the on the TV. Right. Exactly. I mean, right now, you know, most people are only going to have um, you know the phone itself to play back this content on. Yep, and that brings up another point: is that uh, uh, are these are these uh, these self-captured uh, 3D videos and photos um, interoperable between cameras? Like, if I take a 3D picture on my Evo 3D, can I view it back in 3D on my Thrill 4G? Hmm. I think it should be because it's it should be an industry standard. Yeah. Well, it definitely should be, but but it, it should. Hmm. Good we question. Should, we should look into that. That's actually an extremely important thing to uh, to consider. Hmm. We're gonna have to reach out to uh, to some peeps. Get some. Uh, get some uh, answers. I asked that. Brent that the same question when I was at CTIA, and and oh. he didn't have a good answer for me. Hmm. Well, basically, his credit, I mean, I don't. You know, it's not the type of thing that that they're gonna tell you in training. 
I don't want to get techy now, but uh, from what I know about 3D recording and stereoscopic cameras is that you basically have two cameras with two lenses. The left camera captures the right image and the right camera captures the left image. And then it interlaces and puts it in one left, one right, one left, one right, and generates the 3D image. And this should be the industry standard all 3D devices should use. So I think, I think from my point of view that they should be able to play back each other's content. And even if you look at televisions, I mean, you get a 3D Blu-ray, you could plug it into a variety of 3D TVs, and it'll work just fine. So yeah. perhaps there's some standardization going on there. All right, well, let us move on. Uh, we were also talking about T-Mobile's G2X, the first time that the G-Brand, uh, phone of the G-Brand, doesn't have a keyboard. Not really that big of a deal, just kind of an interesting observation. It's basically... The, uh, the Optimus 2X, another Tegra 2 phone, not much to speak of uh, in, in that respect. So It's going to be a popular handset, though, um, obviously because it's fast, but also because, like the Nexus S, it's, uh, going, it goes naked without uh, you know, any, uh, any UI on top of uh, Android. It's naked, and I think, isn't this the first uh, smartphone to do 42 megabits per second HSPA+. Plus? That I'm not sure. I mean, it's definitely uh, you know 4G or, or you know T-Mobile's 4G. It's it's HSPA plus, but I'm I'm not sure if it's 42 or 21. Um, Joe wrote about this. I'm gonna try to pull it up uh, before the end of the call, but that's what I remember, which is pretty significant because in theory, out of the gate, it should be able to do faster data speeds than even the uh, the Thunderbolt, which is on LTE. That would be uh. Well, getting back to your question just a little bit, uh, T-Mobile's G brand moving away from keyboards, uh, I think it's normal with the G2X to drop a keyboard because T-Mobile definitely does not want to uh, to yank its own Sidekick 4G, which is new and which has a keyboard and which is a reborn Sidekick. So uh, having another G device with a keyboard, I think, would be um, bad for sales for the Sidekick 4G. So this was something maybe they had in mind. Fair point. Fair point. Uh, yeah, so here's the article. Um, yeah, so the G2X can do 42 down compared to the, the G2, which can do 14.4 down. Real world testing, you get about half of that, around 7, maybe 10 megabits per second down. So we're talking like 20 megabits per second down in optimum conditions on the, uh, on the G2X, and the Thunderbolt can do about half that. So that's uh, that's some pretty compelling stuff there. It's going to be pretty uh, pretty popular. Is. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, so let us move on. We saw this past the FCC ages ago, uh, but it was officially announced that AT&T is getting the HD7 with an S on it. Uh, S seems to be the uh, the hot letter to use. Yeah, this. my prediction, uh, Desire HDS, coming up. You heard it here first. <laughs> Desire, is, is that what you think the successor is going to be called? I don't know. Like you said, we, now we have the Incredible S, the Wildfire S, Desire S, and the HD7 S. That's four phones. So, you know, why, why would they want to mess things up with the, the Desire HD? I agree with you, Evan, 99%. It's that 1% which I don't agree with you is that the Incredible S is different from the Incredible and so are the other S devices, while the HD7S is not much different from the HD7. Now, give or take the, uh, the, new, uh, the new screen. Okay, well, well, three, you know, revised devices and one... You know, slightly not, but still, you know, there's, there's definitely a trend here that we're seeing. Yeah, that's, that's my 99%, so I agree with you here. We are statist statisticians. Um, yeah, so the big difference between the HD7S and the HD7 is... Whoop. You Did your keyboard know? just fall, Brandon? I, uh, a mouse. I, I was playing with the uh, Thunderbolt and it fell on the keyboard. Um, the HD7S has a super LCD screen, which is a really good thing, because if you ever have seen an HD7, you know that the screen isn't that, that nice. It's just a standard LCD. Uh, the colors are a little bit the washed out. The contrast isn't great. Even motion looks strange when you flick through the program list. 
Um, so presumably the HD7S on AT&T will, will fix that problem. My headphones fell off. And I have a mess over here. Did uh, your keyboard survive the Thunderbolt? Yeah, surprisingly. I mean, the Thunderbolt's like seven pounds. It's huge, yeah. <laughs> uh. um, yeah, so the HD7S on AT&T... Um, is this is this an important device for for AT and T? Do you guys think, or is it kind of just a marginal thing that that a lot of people would really don't care that much about? Well, I think that they are targeting the uh, the segment of the market which is into four inch plus screens. Now, uh, I think AT and T has already two or three devices. Uh, it's I think the surround, the focus, and the uh, LG uh, Quantum. Up, yeah, Quantum Optima Seven Q, and they are all. 3.7, uh, 4.0 inch, and 3.8, if I recall well. They don't have anything beyond 4 inches. And yeah. here comes the HD7S with 4.3 inches. Yeah, I th I think what it does, I think it says more um, maybe about uh, AT&T's intentions than, than anything else in that, you know, clearly there, you know, AT&T seems to be, you know, in it to win it with, with Windows Phone 7 to have, Four devices on you know in the lineup when when everyone else has one or zero right yeah one else even has two well mm -hmm. I, I guess you could say that that T-Mobile has two with the, uh, the Venue Pro and the HD7 but the Venue Pro isn't really available to most people so yeah I mean a AT and T now seems to be like the the de facto carrier to go to if you want uh, a Windows phone as Microsoft announced the premium carrier. Yeah, and they're, yeah. they're certainly showing that. I wonder if they have a sort of different financial arrangement than uh, than the other carriers. Perhaps AT and D gets gets to keep more of the profits, or they pay a lower licensing fee. Although I think it's the OEMs that are paying the licensing fees to Microsoft. Yeah, I suspect that they're that Microsoft sweetened it up. Um, but um, I, I would imagine that after the first round, after those first three phones, that um, you know, if they didn't do that well, that the AT and T wouldn't have taken the HD seven, you know, no matter what the uh, incentives were. That's a good point. This might be a, a testament to uh, Windows Phone seven sales right now, mm -hmm. or at least enthusiasm. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we really heard anywhere that that Windows Phone seven sales are are bad. Right. You now. Maybe one report, but the majority of reports say, you know, it's it's doing okay. You know, some places it's they're moving pretty briskly, some places they're they're just moving a little bit, but they they seem to be, you know, at least moving everywhere. Indeed. Indeed. And we're gonna talk more about Windows Phone 7 and the updates in a few minutes. We wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about the uh AT&T T-Mobile merger, that is sort of really big news for the industry. Uh, but we're trying to figure out what this means for, for you, the consumer. Um, what do you guys think that this, this, is this a good thing, bad thing, or a good and bad thing? Okay, so um, here's what I think. First of all, if, big if, if it gets approved, the merger, because I've heard some rumors that it might not, or at least not in its current form. What I think of the merger is this. Taking into consideration the rules of a free market with free competition, the more players on a market, the better for the consumer. The less players on the market, the more chances are for, for a company to take advantage of that and get into a monopoly position. Now, of course, there's uh, Sprint and there's Verizon, but instead of having four players, there will only be three players. And we know for sure that Sprint and Verizon will not make a merger because neither of them is interested. I think that uh, from the point of view of those 130 million or how many uh, subscribers will be on AT&T and t, &T uh, this will be good on a short term, but what if, I'm just asking, what if in two or three years, AT&T and T subscribers will see some raised fees? So it's a question. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I can't really see all that many benefits for the consumer. I mean, you know, how much did the, how much did the at t singular merger benefit the average uh, cell phone user? You know, Certainly, you don't hear about uh, a lot of AT&T customers, you know, 
saying that they have they have too much bandwidth or that they never you know, drop any calls because that's not true. So I uh, I I don't know. I, I I tend to agree with Tony here that I I don't see all that many benefits to to only having one GSM carrier in the U.S. Although as as um, Verizon moves over more and more towards LTE, Verizon can sort of be considered a, a GSM carrier too. Um, but yeah, I, I, in general, I don't, I don't think that 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 the that consumers are going to see the uh, the the benefits of you know economies of scale or or these all these synergies that they're talking about. I, I don't really think that the the average person on the ground is going to going to see a lot of those benefits. Unless you're an AT and T shareholder, of course. <laughs> uh, but I mean, maybe even not them. If you know if. If things bomb like like some other uh, mergers have bombed, then then everyone loses. Yeah, uh, what I was wondering about, and I was writing about this in a, a little editorial. This this seems like it would be possible, but let's fast forward a year or two from now, and you've got AT and T towers, you've got T Mobile towers. AT and T operates on eight fifty nineteen hundred megahertz, and T Mobile operates on seventeen hundred twenty one hundred megahertz. So. Does this mean we're going to have quad band UMTS phones that can latch onto T-Mobile uh, towers and AT&T towers? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think they said that that T-Mobile's uh, 1700 bandwidth, which I, I believe is their only 3G bandwidth, um, is going to be um, transitions over to uh, LTE spectrum. So, so that means that. Um, that if anything, um, T-Mobile customers are, are going to have to be transitioned over to 3G devices that work on 850-1900. So, so there so will it, basically be no 1700 3G uh, within you know X number of months after the, the merger should it be approved. So won't, they, that, won't that impact people that whose phones rely on that frequency? No, because they're going to, you know, they're going to do it slowly enough so they say that that people won't be affected. That you know, it'll be over a number of years. It's it's not going to happen. You know, within a couple months or even within a year or whatever. So, so what they're telling us, they they seem pretty confident that that the 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 person, the the end user, isn't going to see uh, isn't going to see any effect to this. And uh, are they going to kill the twenty one hundred megahertz band? Um. I didn't know that they were using that now for uh, for for anything. You know, they do 1700 for 3G and then 850, 1900 for for uh, you know 2G. I think it's kind of like AT&T has it, where you can be on the 850 or the 1900. I think the 2100 is probably less utilized, but it's there for certain situations where, for some reason, the AWS 1700 band isn't available. Yeah, I will say that the devices that I see going through the FCC for T-Mobile do not have 2100 uh, that's being tested. It's only 850, 1900, and 1700. There you go. Very good. Let us move on uh, to the next bit here. So Amazon this week launched their App Store, and I'm trying to load it now, but it doesn't seem to be working. Have you guys had a chance to play with the uh, Amazon App Store? No, not really. Me neither. So it's got buttons and apps. Well, actually, I mean, it's it's all right. I still, I'm not going to use it over the 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 App Store and Android, the regular That's, main. Does it have an app yet for Android? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and you've used that? Yeah, we uh we actually posted a video about it. So it's wait, what just happened? Something weird popped up. Yeah, it's uh there's an actual app that is the app store. Um the only really cool part about it is that it has Angry Birds Rio. And I mean everything else seems to be sort of redundant, but lesser quantity. There's maybe five thousand apps in the Amazon App Store, and there's of course one hundred and fifty thousand plus in the market. Sure, but uh, you know we know better than anyone that that numbers really don't mean anything. I mean, you know, uh, those thousand fart apps and radiation apps, and you know, there's there's so many bad apps out there that that I don't 
that I think at this point numbers mean nothing, you know. I mean, the, the difference between an app store with 100,000 and 200,000 apps, uh, I wouldn't say that that one's going to be better by the other one by any means. Right? Sure. Or, or do you think that, that if you have more apps overall, that's indicative of, of that you also have more good apps? I think people want quality apps, and I think what Amazon is doing is providing a level of filtration uh, that the current app store for, for Android just doesn't have. So I'm looking through these apps, and I don't see these like these crappy apps that that just clog the search results in the Amazon app, or not the Amazon app store, the the Android app store. So I think that's that's one of the major benefits. Um, so the overall number long term will be smaller in terms of, of available apps, but presumably though there will be higher quality apps. To choose. How do they do the filtering? I mean, is there a team who is uh, reviewing any uh, application submission and they decide no fart app, no good, Angry Birds good? Or are they based on reviews from the Google market? Or how no, is this? I, I think that they probably have their own team. You know, just like any other any other product being sold on Amazon, I, I would imagine that, that each software title needs to get vetted. You're right. I uh, I have a colleague who submitted an app, and it takes several days. They they t Amazon team tests it. They make sure it's appropriate. Um, whereas on the Android app store, uh, the Android market. You know, right now in ten minutes, I could have an app up in the market without any filtration, so which is also good. Well, which is good in in a way. It's good for the developers. Whoa, crazy ringing going on here. Uh, that's your great <laughs> ringtone. That's hilarious. Oh my God. Oh man, so much ringing. Oh boy. I would I would cut this part out. I don't I don't know if I'd want everyone to know that that's your ringtone brand. <laughs> Which ringtone? There were three phones ringing in here. Whatever, like the the sort of the pop was. I was hoping to to listen to that ringtone of yours with the uh, interference of GSM, which is great, by the way. Oh, Annoying, yeah. but great. Actually, uh, let let me digress for one moment. I gotta I gotta. We were talking about this last week. Um, you guys should listen to this. The Nexus S has these crazy ringtones that sound like GSM interference. Listen. Okay, so you've got that, and then this one. That's awesome. <laughs> Benny Bonassi at his best. Yeah. So, so uh, I was going to say something before. Before we went off in this digression, I, I think that the the timing of the the release of or the the debut of the the Amazon App Store is interesting, um, and I I'm sure they didn't time it this way, but um, this it's coming just uh, you know a week or two after uh, the, there was quite a bit of um, malware in the uh, market that mm. uh, you know Google had to actually go and remove off people's phones, right, and um, so. So I, I think you know now. Now here's Amazon with uh, you know a, presumably a much more secure system where where that wouldn't happen because those types of apps would would never uh, make it through the uh, the vetting process. Indeed. Uh, here's a oh, go ahead. Oh, here's a question for you. We know that there's the uh, Nvidia Tegra Zone, which is the uh, mm, filtering application which filters applications from the Google market based on the, requ the requirements of um, smartphones and tablets. If you have a Tegra 2 powered smartphone or tablet, you use the Tegra zone and there you have all the applications which are for your device filtered. Now say we have an application on the Google market which is uh, $4.99 and you have the same application on the Amazon market which is $3.99 or $2.99. Where will the Tegra zone point you to buy the application? Will Tegra Zone have, let's say, a deal with the Amazon App Store or not? So this is just a question or maybe something to think of. Hmm. It's possible that uh, sort of like when you, let's see, if you have two programs on your Android phone that do the same thing, like an Adobe Reader and also Quick Office or something, and you go to read a PDF, it says choose which program you want to use. So maybe uh, it'll It'll operate like that. Um, we got to get a Tegra 2 phone to, to test that with, but it's possible it would happen on the device level where it would give you the choice. 
well, that will be the smart thing to do because it will bring up uh, results from both markets and you can see where it's uh, the better offer, where's, where it is cheaper and you can buy from the other market. Totally. And there's another good thing too to the Amazon App Store and I think they are giving away a free paid application. I mean, they're giving away for free a paid application every day, a different application, which is good. That is pretty cool. That is a cool. And here's a, yet a third question is, how long do you think it's going to be before Amazon has to change the name of the App Store? <laughs> well, I think they already changed it because it's App Store in one word, and it's not App Store as uh, uh, Apple trademarked it. I think they yeah, trademarked yeah, App Store. Not going to fly. Yeah, I, you're you're right about that. They they put the words together. It's so funny. For like two years, if you go to Amazon.com, you'd see the Kindle as the top feature thing, but now they're really pushing the uh, Amazon App Store for Android. And they're showing it with a really weird looking old HTC phone. They should probably put something nicer there. Well, maybe it's on purpose to see that, uh, to, or to make customers see that it's compatible with the older phones. Oh, could be it. Uh, but maybe it's a, I think it's actually not a real phone. Evan, can you take a look at that? If you go to Amazon.com. Yes. You're pretty good at uh, identifying phones, I hear. It's my favorite game. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it looks like an HTC Magic, but it's got a front-facing camera, and it's very. Oh, thin. you know what? It might be that that I/O device. Let me go look on HTC. There was, uh... or maybe it's the first pyramid render. Oh, that <laughs> better not be the pyramid. Oh yeah, the Google I/O device. Let's see. It looks pretty cool. I think it's the this Google I/O device here. I'll I'll drop this in chat here. Is this it? Let's see. Well, I can't see it because if I go to Amazon.com, I still have Kindle on the front page. So it basically offers me Kindle because of my IP address. Um. And the App Store is US only, as you know. Uh, yeah, I think that's the device. It looks a little bit different, but whatever. It's uh, kind of funny to see. Let's, uh, let's move on. We've got a couple of other things to talk about. So you guys might have seen the video with uh, Joe Belfiore talking about the Windows Phone 7 updates. Did you guys see that? <coughs> yeah, I love that guy. Uh, okay. Well, so he was talking about the updates. And... Um, I was listening very closely to understand what the delay is, and he made it sound like it's the carrier's fault. And to add insult to injury, and maybe there's no injury here, maybe I'm just mistaken, um, Microsoft put up a little phone grid that says, where's my phone update? And it shows you a column for the February update, for the March update. And um, there's a big difference between the international grid and the US grid. The US grid, the February update um, hasn't been deployed at all and it's already the end of March. The March update obviously hasn't been deployed at all but if you go to the international version of the, of the grid, there's, the February update is pretty much out there on every phone except for like France and Spain and then the March update, the no-no update, the one that brings copy and paste is actually um, starting to, to, to roll out, which makes me think that he's telling the truth that in the U.S. it's more difficult to get these updates out for some reason um, than it is in Europe. Could be because um, let's take any country from Europe. The biggest carrier in, let's say, uh, France, Spain, Italy, UK or Germany, big countries, I think has approximately a quarter or a half of the biggest U.S. carrier. They have less phones they have less subscribers. So it's mm, easier for carriers to test and take a device on a run in real life situations than it is in the US, number one. Number two, uh, it's easier to roll out two, uh, two update processes on a European carrier than it is in the US. And since uh, carriers can skip one update but must deliver the skipped updates with the occasion of the second update, we might see both updates coming out at the same time on US carriers. Mm. And what are you getting with these updates again? I forgot. 
So the pre-Nodo, actually, the February update prepares your device for the Nodo update. We right, don't know anything kind of else. In that, uh, like, basically, I mean, all this is just for copy and paste, more or less, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's just funny that, that this is so much for, for you know, a definitely needed functionality, but, you know, for basically one feature, you know, this is this whole, whole, whole blue. I don't think it's about the feature. Uh, I think it's about the process itself. It's about delivering updates over the air or testing and delivering notifications over the air, which is something completely new to Microsoft, completely new to carriers. And it, it, we might see it uh, as a proof of concept rather than delivering copy and paste. Hmm. Yeah, copy and paste will be there because it should have been there from the very beginning. We won't get into why it wasn't uh, included, but uh, once uh, this whole th update thing gets ironed out, we can hopefully see some smoother updating processes for the Mango and maybe in between with smaller updates. Oh gosh, Mango is going to change so much about Windows Phone 7. And if copy and paste is taking this long, right? <laughs> it's going to make people's head explode. Uh, the, the, these people that, that test the phones, I don't even really know what they're, you know, they're making sure that the, the, the apps that they add still work and that the phone still makes calls and all these things, but. Oh, by the way, updates. Uh, I think we have a good chance of seeing the first over-the-air delivered Windows Phone 7 updates sometime in the near future. Windows Phone 7 updates deliver in two ways. Smaller updates deliver over-the-air and bigger updates deliver via cable, via your Zoom uh, software on your PC. And there was a bit uh, last week where Microsoft acknowledged the uh, security flaw in its Internet Explorer on PCs. And they say they were working on a fix to bring that fix and patch to Windows Phone 7 in order to cover, cover its, uh, uh, let's say, um, vulnerability. So being a smaller update, it might be pushed over the air, which will be the first ever Windows Phone 7 update to be pushed via air and not via cable. That's, that's what I think everybody wants, right? They don't want to have to wait for carriers to update. They just want to... They, everyone loves getting that pop-up notification that says, you know, you, you have new software ready for your phone. And, uh, you know. Yes, but one thing is to patch certain files inside the ROM, and the other thing is to build uh, another ROM from scratch, because uh, it's Microsoft that is building these ROMs. As Joe Belfiore said, the difference between Windows 7 and Android is that in case of Android, it's manufacturers and OEMs that build the ROMs and distribute them. With Windows Phone 7, Microsoft is building the ROM. They are building the code, they inject the manufacturer drivers and optimizations, and they deliver out the ROMs. So it's a little bit uh, more steps involved. Interesting. This is all very interesting. Uh, we, shall, we should probably move on, and uh, hopefully those February updates happen close to the end of March, and hopefully the March update happens soon. Uh, oh, right. it was a, it was a bit. Uh, by the way, just one one more thing. Sure. It was a bit. I think on, uh, on a German carrier said that the March update will be deliver, delivered end of April, which is so bad for Microsoft and so bad for the carrier if, if this thing turns out to be true. Yeah, I, well, the I, first I, mistake was calling it the March update. You know, yeah, they, what the heck? They should have just called it like update like, update two. numero uno, and then you know, without putting a timetable on it, then no one would expect it. Yep, I agree. All right, uh, a couple other things we want to talk about. So there's not much news with with iOS right now with with the iPhone. Uh, you know, there's a there's an event coming up presumably in a couple of months or a few months, and um, the iPhone five is going to be announced, which will have a four inch screen and maybe NFC or maybe not NFC. Uh, so there's there's not that much to to talk about in respect to the iPhone, except that. Apple has unleashed a new ad campaign, and people really like Apple advertisements. They're very clever. They're sometimes emotional, um, but this new one is a little bit uh, a little bit arrogant. It's the if you don't have an iPhone campaign. Previously, their ads showed you stuff that you could do with your phone, like read books, like find the nearest sushi joint. But the problem is that you can now do all of those cool things on lots of other phones. So they needed a new angle. And now they show you uh, this thing where um, 
you know, you don't have the if you don't have the App Store, if you don't have Game Center, if you don't have iBooks, you know, these very specific brands, then you don't have an iPhone. Um, what do you guys think about this campaign? I think that's true. If you don't if you don't have an iPhone, you don't have all sorts of great stuff. <laughs> Well, I tend to agree here because um, Apple obviously, uh, and uh, yes, I have an iPhone, and uh, no, I've not become an iPhone fanatic, so this is for the readers and the listeners, but I certainly uh, appreciate the iPhone, uh, the iPhone's quality and Apple services qualities. And uh, of course, if you don't have an iPhone, you don't have the Retina display. Uh, we had an, uh, a post uh, this weekend, and there were so many comments saying that uh, AMOLEDs and Super AMOLEDs are better than uh, than the Retina display. No, guys, they are not. The only screen which is better than the Retina display in terms of uh, of lighting and the brightness is LG's Nova display. Yeah, of course, Super AMOLED brings super contrast, deep blacks, but it doesn't deliver natural colors tends to shade in blue, purple, or pink. With IPS, you get true colors. And with a uh, dots per inch that high, as in with the Retina display, I don't think it will be matched in the next couple of months. And it's already been a year since that one is out. So I think if you don't have an iPhone, yeah, you don't have an iPhone, and you're missing out on the App Store, on iBooks, on Retina display, and so on. I, I have uh, some, some comments about that. I'm somewhat of a screen fanatic, so I tend to obsess about screens. I agree with you in, in, in a lot of ways that the Retina display is the best display in terms of, I think, really two things. Uh, pixel density, ergo screen clarity, reading text on a Retina display, on the Retina, retina display, is unlike anything else. I mean, it's, it's like it's painted, not actually pixels. And two, color reproduction. I think the Retina display provides the best... Uh, realistic colors. Um, that isn't to say, though, that I personally prefer it over, um, over, say, Super AMOLED Plus, which does an insane job with contrast. I think that if you couple the contrast of a Super AMOLED Plus with a higher pixel density of like a QHD screen, then you've got a, you've got a true winner. Might be. Might be. Um, yeah, so this 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 Apple campaign might be true. It seems to me that they're running out of creative juices here, and uh, they're trying to bridge the gap from the iPhone 4, which is beaten in a lot of ways by other devices in certain respects, to the iPhone 5, which will, of course, bring a new wave of innovation, hopefully with dual-core processor, bigger screen, what, whatever it will have. Um, good. Well, let's move on to our final bit for today. Um, uh, so, AT&T has, has announced, sort of casually, that the Atrix 4G and the, um, the Inspire 4G will get updates in April to allow for 4G. Just kidding, that was a joke. Uh, actually, Atrix 4G and Inspire 4G owners will get HSUPA turned on. Which means simply that no longer will your 4G phone feel like a 2G phone. Huh. Uh, it'll it'll actually be as fast as a 3G phone. Now they still haven't addressed the 4G issue. I'm not going to talk about it this time. I got to I got to take a. You just kind of did with uh, your tone. I know. I know. I did. I know. Um, uh, but I mean, that's uh, so. That's a step in the right direction. You know, it's. It, AT&T 3G speeds can be very good at times, and it's just a shame that um, you can't even get that on the Inspire 4G and Atrix 4G. But soon, next month, you'll be able to at least get those speeds. So, I thought I was going to get by without a rant on AT&T's HS no. Plus, but... No chance. No chance. Not, not this time. Uh, very good. So, uh, fellas, do we have any... Phone releases this week. This would be the week of March the 28th. Anything that you can think of? You're blindsiding us here. I didn't know that we were going to have to answer questions like this. This is a pop quiz. <laughs> I, I think the answer is no phones are coming out this week. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've heard that the Optimus 2X is starting to ship uh, in Europe. Yeah, it's the last week of March, yes. Last week of March. 
so so th- th- there's some news. And uh, I've also heard that the... Was it the Desire S? Hmm. The Desire S is right around the corner. You know, it's interesting. A lot of people are very, very, very interested in the Desire S. Um, which is basically... They are interested? Yeah, you know, I'm getting a lot of emails about it. Well, sure, the Desire was a very popular phone, wasn't it? The original Desire was a very popular phone. It was a very good phone. Um, but the Desire S is just... Of the phones announced at Mobile World Congress, I think it's the least impressive. I mean, the Incredible S has an interesting form factor. It's very thin. Uh, the Wildfire S is a updated budget phone. But the Desire S is like, you know, eh, a little bit better, but... But compared to the Desire, it's a lot more attractive, don't you think? I mean, at and least it's it's physically. It will also depend on the pricing. It depends on the pricing. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a nicer looking phone. The Desire had an asymmetrical design, which was kind of yeah. kind of uh, off-putting, I think, to some people. And I don't want people, you know, just to think that I'm all about looks. <laughs> but, uh, but in this case, you know, it's important. Evan looks... Beneath skin to, to see beauty. That's, that's good. Right. <laughs> Beneath the plastic to see the silicon. <laughs> that's smooth. Boom. That's that smooth. Well, well done. Um, very good. Well, this shall conclude the, uh, the eighth Pocket Now Pocket Cast. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Those of you that tune in, we really, really appreciate it. We do this for you. And uh, leave us a comment or send us an email if you have an idea or if you want to perhaps call in next time. We haven't done that yet. So uh, thanks, Evan and Tony, for, for joining. Thanks. Thanks for having us, Brandon. Yep. See ya. Bye.